So we started with sediment on the shoreline moving along the beach. Uh, we moved it offshore with turbidity currents and even onto the deep ocean floor. Uh, we talked about waves and erosion and longshore drift. Um, and basically the kind of sediments that we're talking about here are what we would call the classic sediments when we go to cl classify these um, sediments when they get turned into rock. So they're essentially pieces of rock and um, everything from gravel and sand down to silt and clay. So it's stuff that you can see in the water. In rivers, this was part of the bed load and the suspended load. Same thing for um, wind. This is the bed load, the suspended load. Um, what we've left out, <clears throat> we only talked about it really once, was what happens to the material that's dissolved in the water. And the context that we've talked about it already was in deserts, when water evaporates, um, the material that's dissolved in the water can turn into mineral crystals and settle out and become a deposit that we call an evaporite deposit. That also can happen if you have the right location uh, along the shoreline or on the continental shelf. If you can isolate some water, um, then you can evaporate water and get crystalline deposits. So that can certainly happen on the continental shelf. But there's another extremely important um, bit of activity that's going on on the continental shelf, and that is living organisms. Uh, life in the ocean is very busy. It's very robust. Um, it's been around for hundreds of millions of years, much longer than life on land. Um, and one of the things life in the ocean does is it makes a solid shell in many cases. So if you're thinking about clams, they have a shell on the outside. If you think of um, a, uh, a coral organism, it's got a shell on the outside. There are lots and lots of organisms making shells. Uh, there are even microscopic organisms making shells. So what happens to all of that organic shell material when the organisms die? Um, and it turns out that also becomes part of the sedimentary deposits that we find on the continental shelves. Now, most of the organisms in the ocean that are making shells are doing it with calcium, carbon, and oxygen. Uh, they make the mineral calcite. Uh, we also call it calcium carbonate. It is CaCO3, calcium carbonate. And um, that's what corals use. That's what clams use. Most of the um, things that you see in the ocean are using that to make their shells. Microscopic organisms, most of them calcium carbonate, but there are some few that uh, microscopic organisms that use silicon and oxygen or silicon dioxide, which is the mineral quartz, um, and their deposits um, can be in marine sediments as well. In order to get to the point where you actually have a layer of that, you do have to have some kind of special conditions um, usually it's chemically special because calcium carbonate dissolves pretty readily um, in acid. Um, if we put a drop of acid on it, it will fizz. Uh, if you have a stomach ache and you eat some calcium carbonate uh, in the form of Tums, it dissolves and it settles down your stomach. Silicon dioxide quartz does not react with acid at all. It's much more stable. And so under the right conditions, you can get deposits that are dominated uh, by those single-celled quartz shells. Uh, but that's actually not very common. The much more common deposit that we find is a rock that we call limestone um, that's made of calcium carbonate. And there are a huge variety of limestones. We'll find out next week when we start to look at sedimentary rocks. Um, there can be big shells, and a lot of the limestones are made out of microscopic shells. For example, chalk is made up of microscopic uh, shells. So that's why we have this um, drawing up here of coastal reefs. 
because that's kind of a focus of limestone deposition or calcium carbonate deposition. And you can see in this diagram, you have fringing reefs around this island, and then you have what we call an atoll, which is just uh, basically a reef. Uh, if there was an island in the middle, it is gone and eroded away or maybe sank down. Um, the living organisms that make up the reefs, and it's not always coral, and especially geologically um, speaking, historically going back hundreds of millions of years, there are other organisms that have been reef building um, organisms. <clears throat> But nevertheless, one of the things that they're able to do is that they like to live at a certain depth of water. So they're getting enough sunlight and enough food, enough of whatever they need. And if sea level changes, they will build up or erosion will tear down and they'll stay at kind of a certain level below the water. So they're able to respond to that. And they will keep building and building and building and can give you very, very thick deposits of calcium carbonate or, or basically of their shells. And if we look at what this looks like along the coast, it looks like this. So this is what we would call a, uh, a carbonate platform, which is just a uh, platform within the ocean. It means it's higher than the, than the surrounding seabed. Um, and it's built up and maintained by living organisms. And you might have a, several different kinds of organisms. So you might have corals out here in the front. There might be other types of shellfish here in the back, all combining to build up this deposit of limestone. And so that's kind of where we leave it um, in terms of our deposition, environments of deposition. We've moved offshore, talked a little bit about deep sea, and now a little bit about carbonate platforms. So this is a fairly short slide presentation. The last slide that we have <clears throat> um, is just a little bit about where petroleum comes from. The organic material present in marine sediments, if it is buried and heated to the right temperature, it can be turned into what we refer to as petroleum or many people call oil. Uh, but petroleum is a complex mixture of different organic compounds, um, hydrocarbon compounds, um, that depending on the starting material and the temperature and everything else, you can get different mixes, um, but we call that mix uh, petroleum. And so that petroleum becomes part of the sedimentary deposit. Uh, typically, uh, petroleum is associated with deposits of organic material, limestone, or mud that happens to have a lot of organic material in it. That's usually where the petroleum is generated. And then after the petroleum forms, um, because it's liquid, it will move up into more permeable rock layers like sandstone. So typically, if you have an oil field, um, they look for shale or limestone as the source, uh, but then they also have to find a sandstone somewhere above it where the petroleum over a long period of time has migrated and then filled in the pore spaces in that sandstone. Um, because we use this resource so heavily, um, we've started going to the source rock. And so if you've heard of the term fracking, Fracking is simply the process of instead of going into a nice, very permeable sandstone to get your petroleum, um, to go find the source rock, run a horizontal drill through that layer, and then put a bunch of uh, liquid in there under pressure to fracture that layer open so the petroleum can then flow out. So it's basically kind of going to the source of the petroleum and trying to draw it out of that source rock instead of what we would refer to as the, the reservoir rock. So anyway, um, that's a little bit more in depth. Uh, we go into that uh, quite a bit more in environmental geology, but that's plenty for you to know. Uh, basically what we're saying is that organic material, what's inside the shell organism,
or if you wash a bunch of plant material out into the ocean, that organic material under the right conditions can turn into petroleum. Um, under conditions uh, that are not so Goldilocks, um, you can still get natural gas. So that is it for our sedimentary environments. Next week, what we will do is talk about um, how sedimentary rocks are formed and then how we can look at those rocks and work back and figure out what environment they were formed in. And then we can build a story of the Earth's history from those sedimentary rocks. We can see which environments were present and how that changed through time. So that's something to look forward to next week.